Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess since we're here in the blockchain session, everyone has probably heard about the DAO hack, very infamous, occurred uh, 2016. And actually, there were 3.6 million Ether stolen by an attacker from this infamous the DAO contract. Uh, in fact, it was about $50 million, I think, and fi that, so 5% of all available Ether at that time. So it's quite a severe attack. So in fact, it was so severe, the Ethereum developers decided to perform this hard fork where they reverted the DAO attack. And actually, some other people disagreed with that, and now we have Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, where we still have the DAO attack. Um, now, let me just give you like a simplified uh, explanation of this DAO attack. Um, so we have the DAO, which is this kind of venture capital fund where you can invest money and at some point you will get uh, some profit out of it. And the split DAO function uh, allows a user or an attacker to split off some funds into a so-called child DAO. And this is the functionality that was abused by the attacker. Um, so the attacker calls this uh, split DAO function which will then create a child DAO. And the DAO keeps track of the amount of ether every user invested into the DAO. So in this case, this is uh, 100 for the attacker. And in total, the DAO has, in this example, 1,000 ether. At the start, the child DAO has no ether. And then the attacker will execute the split DAO. And the first step is, the DAO will check whether the attacker has invested enough ether to, um, so first step is to check ether balance. Um, so this is okay, so the, the attacker has invested 100, so um, the DAO will move 100 uh, from the DAO into the child DAO. And then there is this interesting functionality in the DAO which calls back to the attacker to transfer a small amount, a uh, small reward, so this can be as low as zero, but the important thing is it calls back into the attacker, and now the attacker can execute code again. Normally, you would just return, accept the reward, and continue, um, but in the case of the DAO attack, the attacker will simply call split DAO again. So we again check the balance, but the balance hasn't been updated yet. So it's still 100, and the DAO will happily transfer another 100 ether, to the child DAO. Now the attacker can actually repeat this as long as there is enough gas. And at the end, there will be zero ether left in the DAO and everything will be moved to the child DAO. So this is what we call an re-entrancy attack. Now the question is, okay, can we somehow automatically find out if our contracts are vulnerable? And as you're probably aware, there's been a lot of research and bug finding, exploitation, verification on smart contracts. And all the blue ones are works which uh, actually claim or to detect reentrancy bugs and vulnerabilities. Just a quick summary of the prior work. So the cool thing is most of those are like symbolic execution tools or static analysis tools, and you can just plug in your contract and will tell you there's an integer overflow there, here's a reentrancy, go fix your contract. So it's pretty good for a developer. Unfortunately, there are a lot of false positives, especially if you consider reentrancy attacks. Furthermore, they do not really analyze combinations of contracts. So if you use multiple dynamic libraries or you have multiple contracts working together very closely, well, they have a hard time analyzing that. And finally, there's no protection of deployed contracts. So as soon as you deploy your contract onto the blockchain, well, it's immutable. You have to somehow manually add an upgrade path, which is not really clear how to do that. Or even if you find a bug in the contract, you know, do not necessarily know, know where to report that bug to. Yeah. So this uh, led us to our research questions, which are one, do the existing tools cover all the reentrancy bugs that are out there? And second, can we also somehow protect deployed contracts against this problem? So our contributions are, first, we describe some overlooked reentrancy attack patterns, which are not really well handled by existing tools. Then we present Serum, which is our hardened Ethereum client. 
And Serum includes a taint tracking engine for EVM bytecode. So we don't require any source code, we just rely on what is stored on the public Ethereum blockchain. And based on this, uh, we de developed a runtime detection for reentrancy attacks. And finally, we performed an investigation of root causes for our false positives. Um, but those are also interesting for other analysis tools uh, because it shows that analyzing EVM bytecode is not always that easy. So let me tell you about those overlooked reentrancy attack problems. So the first one is like the cross-function reentrancy. So we have a victim contract with function A. And function A performs an external call. So this might lead to uh, the attacker executing code. But the developer of the victim contract is kind of security conscious, so A is absolutely safe to be re-entered. So if the attacker would call A again, nothing would happen. But actually nothing stops the attacker from re-entering a different function. And if A and B share some state, this might lead to a re-entrancy bug. A second attack is what we call delegated reentrancy. Here the victim contract, again, is a function A. And function A is not reentrancy safe. But function A doesn't perform an external call. So you would say, OK, there cannot be, the attacker cannot execute code, so it's safe. However, in this case, um, the victim contract uses a library contract. So this is a completely different contract on the blockchain, different address. But if the victim co uh, contract calls function B, it will use the delegate call instruction. And this instruction basically transfers uh, all the rights on the internal state and the balance to the library contract. And now the library contract can perform the external call. Now if you just look at function A, it seems safe. If you look at function B, it seems safe. But if you combine them, actually it might lead to a reentrancy vulnerability. The third attack is crate-based reentrancy. And here it's similar. We have two contracts involved on the side of the victim, uh, the victim contract and a newly created contract. So in this case, function A, is, we assume it's not reentrancy safe, but it doesn't perform an ex external call directly. But it will create a new contract with the create instruction. And the create instruction immediately triggers execution of the constructor. And the constructor can basically do anything. And this includes calling to the attacker. So function A, if you analyze it, sound, there's no external call, so you might conclude, OK, it's safe for, um, it's, there's no reentrancy bug, right? But the constructor of the newly created contract actually performs the external call. So you can, the attacker could re-enter function A again, and it becomes vulnerable again. So a quick overview of uh, a couple of analysis tools that uh, detect reentrancy issues. So we have Oriented Securify ECF, ECF Checker, which are academic projects, and also Manticore Mithril, uh, which are industry tools. And as you can see, same function reentrancy is like almost everyone detects that. Um, also for cross-function reentrancy, it's not that bad. But if we take a look at delegated and create-based reentrancy, where you have to analyze more than one contract, well, especially static analysis, analysis tools, they have a hard time um, dealing with that. So we designed Serum, and Serum, um, we developed it such that it detects all of those types of reentrancy attacks. How do we do it? So the main observation we had is typically a reentrancy attack exploits some inconsistent state at the time when the vulnerable contract decides whether to take a branch. So as an attacker, you will want to subvert some business logic, right? So you want to spend more ether than you invested. You want to vote more than once, maybe. Um, so this is always on the smart contract level, some branch which decide, decides whether you are allowed to or not. Let me illustrate with an example. So here we have solidity function. Uh, it's called withdraw, so it just checks whether the sender has invested enough ether and will then um, send it back to the sender. So here we have this if condition, which uh, does the branching, so it checks the balance if there is enough ether. If not, it will simply return. But if there's enough ether, it will send the ether and update the balance afterwards. So this is vulnerable to reentrancy. And what Serum does is 
it will mark this variable balance as a critical variable because it influences the decision whether to take the true or false branch. And then we will prevent further updates um, with write logs, which means we keep track of those critical variables and if they are written to in a later invocation, we will stop this uh, update. So rough architecture of Serium. So we extended the Go Ethereum client and we added a Taint engine, which is uh, closely integrated with the bytecode interpreter. And the Taint engine will notify the attack detector when uh, something fishy happens and the attack detector um, keeps track of all the write logs and critical variables. Optionally, we can run in enforcement mode, which means as soon as we detect an attack, we will roll back the whole transaction and basically revert the whole attack. Let me give you a detailed example of how it works. So we start off with the victim, and the victim will first check the balance and then transfer the ether. This will then call the attacker, and now the attacker will maliciously re-enter the victim. Now let's have a closer look at what happens in this check balance state. So on the EVM level, we will have a bunch of EVM instructions such as sload, which basically loads from persistent state. In this case, from one to three for five, then we will have some computation, for example, comparison. And finally, we have the jump I instruction, which implements a conditional jump. So our taint engine will track the data flow from the as load instruction to the condition of the jump I. And then we can mark this attacker balance, which in this case is at one, two, three, four, five hex, as a critical variable. Note, we do not lock it yet. So then we will again transfer ether. This is done with the call instruction. We'll call the attacker, but this time the attacker will just return. We will update the balance, and then we will return. And only on the return, we will okay, say, okay, all critical variables from this invocation, so in this case, the attacker balance at one, two, three, four, five, will be locked from now on. Then we return to the attacker again, and the attacker now has to return to the victim again, and now the second time update balance is executed. So this is typically a, a store instruction, and here it writes, writes to this um, address, one, two, three, four, five, hex, and Serum will note that and say, this is a write to um, a locked variable, so we will raise an alert. Because if we would allow this write, then there would be an inconsistency in the state between the first invocation and the re-entered invocation. And this is what we want to avoid. So we have evaluated Serum. Um, we re-executed the first 4.5 million blocks of Ethereum we successfully detect uh, the DAO incident. Uh, in total, we have about 50,000 transactions which are flagged as attacks. And then we did some manual reverse engineering and anal analysis. Um, we have about 2,000 true attack transactions. And we noticed that there are only about 14 functionally distinct contracts which actually result in false positives. So this leaves us with about 0.06% false positive rate. I guess that's pretty good. And to conclude my talk, a uh, story about the curious case of the DSETH token. So we found 43 transactions, which are kind of weird. They all started with a function called to the attack function. So it was pretty obvious what was going on. Um, and then we did some research and we found out actually the developers themselves uh, attacked the contract because they found out it was vulnerable and had no other way to get the funds out of that contract. And this actually occurred seven days before the DAO incident. Okay, with that, I'm at the end of my talk. Uh, we have some examples for those reentrancy attack patterns on our GitHub. Uh, check it out. Otherwise, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. <laughs> Clara Schneiderwind from TU Vienna. Um, you mentioned that you're also having an enforcement mode. So how does this work? And isn't it actually disinfluencing the consensus then? I mean, how can you change the rules just for one client? Yeah, you'd have to implement that on all clients. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Roland Yap from NUS. 
Uh, just wondering for the false positive, is it due to the tainting? Sorry, I... I, I, I was wondering uh, about the false positive. So is the reason for the false positive due to over-tainting? Um, or is it some other reason? Or both? Not only over-tainting. So we have some issues like field sensitivity and some weird solidity things, manual locking. Um, but uh, we analyzed this and I can take a look at the paper. We identified five major causes and yeah. Okay, Yin Chen Zhang from Ohio State. I, I have a question about uh, your, have you, have, you, have you thought about um, applying your, uh, applying Serum on, on for to, to defeat other types, of, uh, other types of attacks, other than re-entry attacks? <coughs> yeah, actually we're currently working on that, but I can't say much about it yet. <laughs> okay, maybe you should talk, take, take that offline. Yeah. Okay. 